I've seen pictures of it. It was one of these Mud Street frontier towns. This was the last part of Ohio to be settled, and Hardin County was uh, densely forested with huge trees. In fact, I ran into an old man uh, down in Cincinnati once. He said, where are you from? I said, oh, I'm from Ada. He says, oh yeah, where the big trees come from. Long before he set foot in Johnstown, Ohio, a backwoods village that would later be renamed Ada, a young country teacher named Henry Solomon Lur nurtured a bold idea. He envisioned a different kind of school, a private normal school that would elevate teacher education and better serve rural students of the mid-19th century, no matter what they're calling in life. We know it today as Ohio Northern University. Could a college so arrange its curriculum that a student could enter at his convenience and study what he wanted to study when he wanted to study it? Henry Solomon Leur. I think that one of the things that people need to realize is that uh, Henry Solomon Lur had a vision that reached out into a, a time that was the frontier. Ada, Ohio was a lumber town. It was a rough place. He saw the need for education, he saw the need for teachers, and he said, hey, the way we're going to do this is at the frontier. And Ada was the frontier. Henry Solomon Lur entered a classroom for the first time at 12 years of age. His family had migrated from Pennsylvania to Ohio shortly before his birth and started a weaving business. Times were hard and the family was poor. Making ends meet left little time for formal education. And at eight years old, Henry was already at work, assisting on his father's loom. The family roots were Pennsylvania Dutch. The language spoken at home was German. I went to common school all told about one year, from 1850 to 54. In that time, I learned to speak English. I was also considered a good speller, but I think I never scribbled over a dozen sheets of paper to learn to write before I began teaching school. Henry Solomon Lur. I have come across people who um, I have thought of as educated and have been surprised to learn that they, how much they've educated themselves. I, I think that that's part of his Renaissance man is, he didn't feel confined to, well, I'm a doctor or well, I'm a lawyer, but I'm gonna learn everything I can about everything. In the spring of 1854, a fortuitous encounter changed his life forever. A book salesman visiting the school presented Henry with a brochure from Alfred Holbrook's private school in Marlboro, Ohio. His teacher believed that if Henry attended Holbrook's school in the fall, he would be able to teach the next winter. With money earned from working the harvest and a $25 loan from his brother, Henry enrolled in Alfred Holbrook's school for the fall term in 1854 to take the first step in his career. Henry had made up his mind. He wanted to teach. When he sat among 52 applicants for the teacher's exam, one of the examiners pointed at Henry and declared, that boy will carry home the best certificate given today. Despite being just 16 years old and physically small in size, Henry secured his first teaching position at the Dutch Flat School near Worcester, Ohio in the winter of 1854. In his very first school, the rumor went around once people saw him that they'd hired a child of 14 to teach the class. Well, he mentions that he did have some problems with, as you might suspect, some tough guys in the, in the, the classes. But he was able to win them over pretty much to his, to his way of thinking. The next several years brought positions in neighboring country school districts. Between terms, Henry continued his own education, later enrolling at Mount Union College. In those days, the college curriculum was inflexible. Over seven years, he had worked on the farm for approximately nine months and taught for 33. His experiences ultimately gave 
birth to an ideal. While traveling to Mount Union for the spring term of 1861, Lur heard the news that would tear the country apart. The Confederate Army had just attacked Fort Sumter. Although he was small in stature and weighed only 110 pounds, Lur enlisted immediately. He ultimately fought at the Battle of Nashville and served as a chief ward nurse at the Nashville Post Hospital. He was discharged in 1865, and like thousands of young men who served in the Civil War, faced decisions about his future. His big idea for a different kind of school, a private, normal school, was very much in mind. I believed in co-education of the sexes, and I believed that a school could be so conducted that a student could study what he wanted when he wanted to study it. But where should I found such an institution? That was the important question to be answered. Henry Solomon Lur. A man of incredible vision and, and drive. And I think the two of those together drove him to create the school. Realizing that Northeastern Ohio already had plenty of colleges, Lur looked westward. He applied for teaching positions and pitched his idea for a private normal school in several towns in Northwestern Ohio and Indiana. There were no takers until he arrived in Ada in March 1866. Ada seemed a most unlikely place to establish a school, but Ada offered one huge advantage, transportation. The Pennsylvania Railroad put Ada uh, on a major east-west rail line, and Lur was able to count on there being a, a large or larger student body available. Lur saw the potential in Ada and forged ahead. He explained his plan to the Board of Education and was awarded a contract. He would teach in the public school with permission to use the school building for his select or private tuition school when the public school was not in session. By 1870, he was able to um, sort of take the wraps off, I suspect what was initially his, or originally his plan, of something even more ambitious than that select school, namely the institution that became Ohio Northern University. In the fall of 1870, a contract was signed between Lur and the citizens of Ada. Plans for construction of Henry Lur's private normal school began in earnest. There actually was a very great degree of concern about where in Ada, a very small village, where this facility would be located. Now people realized that, that the uh, university would uh, help boost uh, property values and the like. But you know, even so, we're talking about maybe a square mile of land. So it's a little strange to think about. With construction underway, Lur focused on developing an academic calendar and curriculum. The first year catalog clearly reflected his goal of making college accessible to all with a special effort to accommodate the needs of teachers. The first term of the Northwestern Ohio Normal School was set to begin on August 14th, 1871. New students came from all directions, filling Main Street with horse-drawn wagons driven by their fathers. They were hopeful, excited, and fully engaged with getting an education. Henry Lur's ideal was coming to life. Mr. Lur's appeal was not to the wealthy, but to those who yearned for an education and had little or no opportunity to secure it. He created an opportunity by presenting a practical course of study at a minimum cost. Sarah Lur Kennedy. The normal school's first term opened with an enrollment of 147. Many classes were formed to meet the needs of the new students. Lur maintained a grueling daily schedule, teaching 13 classes from 5 o'clock in the morning until 8 at night. At the beginning of the term, I taught three hours before breakfast to accommodate some members in the class in rhetoric. That class met about two weeks at 4 o'clock a.m. As the rhetoric class consisted of only two members and one of the two had begun teaching, I examined the class and gave each member a grade, and stopped the class. Henry Solomon Lur. Mr. Lur was a past master in the art of selecting teachers. 
Every one of them was not only well prepared in his line of work, but every one of them had a strong personality, or heart power, as Mr. Lur called that indefinable quality that attracted others, as a magnet draws steel. Sarah Lur Kennedy. Some of those early people uh, are memorialized in the stained glass windows that currently occupy the west end of Presser Hall. Park is there with his uh, a lamp of knowledge, Maglot with a, a telescope because he did teach uh, astronomy. They were, uh, in many respects, a fairly extraordinary group of uh, uh, people. We are a teaching institution. That is how we were founded. That is what we're about. Our students thrive in that environment. At first, the main focus of the school, educationally speaking, was uh, pedagogy to a limited degree, you know, teaching people how to teach. I think he saw that, all right, we have school teachers now. We're, we've, we're training school teachers and they're going out and they're teaching to the, to the general populace. And now we need the professional schools, again, to meet the needs of the frontier, which was rapidly moving away from being a frontier to being civilization. He knew that he was living in a changing time and by golly, Northern was gonna change with it. It was gonna be part of it. Within a year after the first building opened, a commercial course was added to the curriculum. It was the forerunner of the College of Business we know today. Some of the practical courses offered included bookkeeping, railroading, merchandising, and importing. By the early 1880s, the commercial course had evolved to a formal business college. Classes took place in a series of offices which mimicked actual commercial establishments. Forms, ledgers, and currency were provided to make the operations as realistic as possible. I, I think that's one of the hallmarks of our business program is that we really do things with our students outside of the classrooms. They're gonna work for an employer so they know what it's like to have the day-to-day -day job and really to bring the skills. Those are things that really make the unique education here at ONU. Practical coursework in the professions followed quickly. Within 15 years of the normal school's opening, Lur established professional colleges in engineering, law, and pharmacy. If you go and look at what Mr. Lur did, he came from service. He was a soldier in the Civil War. He saw the impact of a horrible issue dealt with through conflict. And he wanted to make people capable of dealing th with things rationally and reasonably. And education is the way to make that happen. Lur also took note of 1884 legislation requiring that pharmacists be examined and registered by the state of Ohio. He recognized that pharmacy apprentices throughout the state would seek education to prepare for their licensing exams. The state mandated that it wasn't enough to be a, a pharmacist apprentice somewhere, just mixing things up and hoping you don't kill someone. They said, okay, you are going to have to have a certain level of education. And that was something that Lur jumped on immediately because he said, aha, here is something that we can do that needs to be done. Ohio Northern's mission has always been about the welding of the professional programs and the liberal arts and sciences. I think that they're in keeping with Lur's vision for higher education, what he called practical education and classical education. Law, engineering, pharmacy, teaching were practical skills. He didn't go about establishing them in some, according to some sort of methodical uh, blueprint. Uh, someone came to him and said, well, Dr. Lurk, can I take engineering courses? And he said, wait a minute. He went out and hired a couple of faculty. He said, yeah, now we have an engineering college. He was an entrepreneur. He was an educational entrepreneur. Annual enrollment increased steadily throughout the 1870s and 80s and led to significant changes in the organization of the school. In 1885, the name was changed from Northwestern Ohio Normal School to Ohio Normal University. Enrollment now included students from throughout Ohio, 
as well as from 21 states and two foreign countries. The combination of colleges providing instruction in professional studies now constituted a true university. Prior to 1885, we are a normal school. It was offering a bona fide educational program. What they couldn't do was to award a bona fide diploma. That was a legal requirement. Lur and his partners also incorporated the university as an institution of learning not for profit. They now had the legal right to confer degrees as much as any church owned or state college or university. Despite his success as an innovator, marketer, and educational entrepreneur, Henry Solomon Lur was, first and foremost, a president for his students. He never forgot that students brought the university to life and sustained it through their vitality and personal success. Without them, Ohio Normal University was merely an idea. His students referred to him over the years very affectionately as the little professor. They somehow sensed by what he did, by his, his, his demeanor, tone of voice, that he really cared about them. You know, he would bring them into his home and if they had nothing, he would make arrangements for them to go to school. And, you know, he loved educating and he loved educating them. There's a scene in, that was depicted, one where he's caring for a sick student. And I think of his wife and all of the sacrifices that the two of them joyfully made to build this, this really remarkable institution. By the late 1890s, times were changing, and external developments also began to pressure the normal schools. Throughout the country, entrance requirements to institutions of higher learning were tightening, but the biggest threat of all came from the states. The majority of educators supported the establishment of state-run normal schools. Lur knew the coming years would be difficult and very likely marked the end of the private normal school era. In 1897, Lur had attempted to convert Ohio Normal to a state institution. The deal fell through. By 1898, there remained only one solution that would ensure Ohio Normal University's future the transfer of ownership to the Central Ohio Conference of the Methodist Church. I've thought over the years that maybe that would have been a, a good thing for Northern to be able to tap into state resources. But then as I've thought about it, it wouldn't have been Northern. It, it, it would have been a branch campus of Ohio State University. It would have lost the Northern spirit the kind of spirit that let the student body be full-time even during COVID. Lur guided the university through the transfer process, then remained as a vice president when Dr. Leroy Belt became president. Their relationship was difficult, and Lur officially retired from the university in 1902. Leroy Belt served as president from only 1900 to 1905. However, several events during his brief tenure put Ohio Northern on track for the 20th century. One of the main reasons I chose ONU was because of the, the family feel of walking around campus. I know I grew up in a small town, like three or 400. So the, the feel here on campus was really nice. It felt like home. A lot of small class sizes, I'm able to get to know my professors on a personal level, um, talk to them about stuff outside of, outside of school and outside of ONU, which is really nice. It's great to know that I'm a part of, part of a university and part of a story that has such a storied past and such a storied history. Um, knowing that there have been 149 years of students uh, before me, uh, that have come through the university. Uh, and it's, it's just nice to know that there's, there's a, a nice building block um, that's kind of led me to where I am today. So President Belt had the unenviable task of having to follow President Lur, which was made even more challenging by Lur remaining an active member of ONU and the Ada community 
for the first part of his administration. But even with that challenge, Belt was able to accomplish a lot in his brief five years at ONU. President Leroy Belt immediately pursued funding for new buildings which were desperately needed, and the campus soon welcomed two indispensable new facilities. Brown Auditorium provided seating for the entire student body, creating adequate chapel space for the first time in the university's history. Duke's Memorial provided many classrooms as well as chemistry and physics laboratories. The name of the university also changed once and for all. A group of engineering students started a movement to change from Ohio Normal University to Ohio Northern University. They were led by Tommy Small, who was destined to become a giant at ONU. Well, uh, Thomas Jefferson Small, also known as the father of ONU Athletics and the dean of the College of Engineering, was certainly the student who got the ball rolling on that. It was partially because the students in engineering and other professional programs felt that having the word normal anywhere in the institution's name sort of demeaned the school. And the other was, uh, it, certainly the administration was happy to do that because the institution had advanced quite far beyond those normal school foundations. Dr. Belt resigned from the presidency in 1905 because of advancing age and ill health. He had successfully positioned Ohio Northern for the new century, setting the stage for his successor, Dr. Albert Edwin Smith, to lead the school's transformation. A devoted clergyman with a commanding physical presence and eloquent public speaking skills, Smith embodied the leadership the university needed in the early 20th century. His 25-year presidency brought a complete revamp of curriculum and an aggressive expansion program, which included the Lur Memorial, Presser Hall, Taft Gymnasium, and the Huber Law Building. He also purchased much of West Campus, a portion of which would soon become known as the Tundra. Because he was a public speaker of apparently some um, uh, significant talent and well-connected with uh, people within the Methodist Church, uh, he was able to be a, a very successful uh, fundraiser. President Smith also had a knack for publicity. Much like founding President Henry Lur, he knew how to take advantage of or create an opportunity that would generate media coverage for the school. In 1910, Smith was able to secure President William Howard Taft as the commencement speaker. An estimated 15,000 visitors heard President Taft's address, but the cherished memory for each graduate was being handed his or her diploma by the President of the United States. The Ohio Northern student body now hailed from many states, from large cities as well as small towns, and to a limited extent from other countries. They came with a broader view of the world than students of the previous generation, and perhaps had greater expectations for the social aspects of their college experience. Fraternities, sororities, clubs, and social events became a bigger part of life at Ohio Northern than ever before. As a result, students often found themselves at odds with President Smith. A strict Methodist disciplinarian, Dr. Smith took a strong stance against fraternities, dancing, smoking, alcohol, and jazz, with a little effect. If there's one thing we know about college students, is they will poke the needle in the balloon of pomposity every chance they're given. One of Ohio Northern's written histories describes a student's recollection that brakemen on the Pennsylvania Railroad heading east from Lima would stop the train outside of Ada. Students who had had a bit too much to drink in the Lima saloons could get off the train far up the track and avoid a possible encounter with President Smith. It seemed that Dr. Smith often visited the train station on Saturday and Sunday nights to greet his students with a watchful eye. Another tale relates how some students, particularly engineers, were inspired to grease the tracks of the railway. Much to the chagrin of the conductor, the wheels of the train spun helplessly until the tracks could be sanded or the grease removed. I think by uh, today's standards, we look at it as being sort of sepia tone, innocent pranks. It was almost um, inevitable. I think Dr. Smith set himself up for a certain amount of that. 1913 became a year of crisis. 
Student discontent and fraternity expulsion issues resulted in student petitions to remove Smith from office. The effort failed. Later that same year, a huge fire destroyed much of the administration building, which had been completed in 1879, and severely damaged adjacent Brown Auditorium. The literary societies had lost virtually everything in the fire. Since being introduced by Henry Lur in the earliest days of the university, they had provided outstanding forums for public speaking, vigorous debate, and entertainment. But interest in the societies had been declining for several years. Now, interest waned even further. The literary societies at ONU are a product of a bygone era now. Throughout the early history of the school, students, in fact, were required to be a member of one of the literary societies. Lur really viewed it as a place for students to be able to express what they were learning in the classroom and to really own their skills, their rhetorical skills, their social skills that would help them in their life. President Smith, his administration and faculty, students, and the Ada community acted decisively to maintain university operations and rebuild. Their collective response to the tragedy provided reassuring insight to the character of university leadership. The year of crisis had become a defining moment for Ohio Northern. Global crises in following years also left their mark on Ohio Northern, if only for a time. Enrollment dropped significantly during World War I, but later rebounded and surpassed pre-war levels. Student interest in the military drill declined after World War I in favor of athletics. The Ohio Northern Military Department, which had played a prominent role in university life since the early 1880s, was disbanded and replaced by the Department of Physical Education in 1921. The new department gave a powerful boost to competitive athletics. The polar bear mascot first appeared in 1923. That same year, the baseball team won the Ohio Conference Championship. And in 1929, brothers Clyde and Harris Lamb joined the faculty. They would influence the evolution of ONU athletics for the next 40 years. After retiring from Ohio Northern in 1902, founder Henry Solomon Lur moved to Indiana for several years. He returned to Ada years later and enjoyed a private life surrounded by his family and friends, and always staying in touch with his former students. President Lur lived to see a memorial building erected in his honor, a testimony to his life, his vision, and his great ideal. Henry Solomon Lur passed away in Ada on January 23, 1923. Despite the global events that affected Ohio Northern, it seemed as if the growth and development enjoyed throughout President Smith's 25-year tenure would never end. He retired in 1929 with an outstanding record of service and achievement. The years 1930 through 1946 characterize ONU's perseverance and resilience more than any era in the school's history. Enrollment declined. There was very little money and mounting debt. President Robert Williams led Ohio Northern through the Great Depression managing to reduce expenses, service debt, and balance the university budget. In late 1931, President Williams, who students called intensely human, had relaxed the 25-year ban on dancing at Ohio Northern. The previous year, he had allowed the re-establishment of sororities, which had been banned from campus since 1921. These simple actions by President Williams undoubtedly brought rays of sunshine to the dark days of the Great Depression. It was lucky that nobody realized that World War II was around the corner, or you may have had everybody running for the exits. I don't know. To compensate for the massive decline in enrollment during the war, Williams established a flight training program for the Army Air Corps and officer training for the United States Navy. Against all odds, the university survived but the toll on President Williams was severe. In poor health, he resigned in 1943. President Robert O. McClure immediately took the helm. The situation was bleak. Wartime enrollment remained very low, while debt continued to rise. President McClure stepped in. He got the faculty together and he said, hey, do we really want to open this place? Maybe we should just close. 
And there also had been discussions with the trustees about, do we really want to keep these professional programs going? Maybe we should just be a liberal arts institution. At that point, the enrollment was below 200. By unanimous agreement, McClure and his faculty opted to move forward. They trimmed programs but kept the school up and running. The university persevered. And then in 1944, the federal government did something marvelous. They passed the GI Bill. And suddenly, institutions all across the country, including Northern, said, let's grab that lifeline. And the war's end brought a flood of returning veterans to campus. Northern went from a situation where uh, by, I think it was 1947, 1948, there were just a little over 1,200 returning students on campus. Trying to find a place for all these people to live was quite a challenge. The university had some of those, what we call trailers. They really were almost tar paper boxes they were put in what they called trailer colonies. Those were scattered across campus. The McClure team successfully managed the huge influx of students and families. With the support and invaluable help of his entire faculty, McClure's handling of the wartime crisis became another defining moment for the university. Without their efforts, Ohio Northern would likely no longer exist. And so while he was only here for a brief time, and we might not talk about him as much. Uh, you know, he's a president that we owe a lot to, and we need to remember that. Poor health kept Dr. McClure at home for much of the last year of his presidency. He resigned in 1949. The Great Depression and World War II left Ohio Northern with painful wounds. When appointed president in 1949, Dr. F. Bringle McIntosh quickly discovered a university in crisis. The future of Henry Solomon Lur's vision and his legacy were crumbling. Even on rainy days, the campus looks really nice. Like, especially, I think the snow is when it looks best because it kind of, the tundra really feels like a tundra, but nah. I'd probably say the tundra is my favorite space because it's so open, there's so much to do. My mom told me that college would be the best time of my life and I think because of how the ONU culture and how everybody is and how kind everybody is and how welcoming people on the campus are, the staff and all that, it really made college very enjoyable for me. Last semester I took a writing seminar and my teacher always went around like every Monday and would ask me oh, how's your classes going so far? And like would ask everyone in the class how they were doing, how they felt about the week. And one week I was really stressed for a physics exam. And I said that, and then the next week he held me over before class and he was like, Caitlin, how'd your physics exam go? And I was just so impressed that like, he remembered that I was stressed the week before, but then remembered what it was about. So just knowing how much I felt cared about and how much they do really want you to succeed, but just not in school-wise, but in life itself. <clears throat> My greatest surprise in coming here was the condition of the university. Uh, it was in bad shape. And uh, they were broke, clear down to the hilt. In 1949, newly appointed president Dr. F. Bringle McIntosh discovered a university with little financial reserve. Buildings and equipment were in poor condition. There were no dormitories, and World War II veterans were still being housed in surplus military trailers. We did not have any dorms until the mid 20th century, and so students typically, um, if they didn't live with their families, uh, boarded somewhere in the village with a local family. A lot of local landlords and landladies were very happy with that. If you had, let's say, a widow, and she maybe suddenly had a, a room or two available, um, that would be, you know, great. At this point, Ohio Northern's survival hung in the balance. The problems faced by McIntosh were enormous. 
Dr. Mack was a very good speaker, an orator. We shall build sufficient student housing to properly house all of our single students living in the community. In my judgment, there is a certain sense of destiny becoming evident in the varied experiences of this university. He, he was a good leader. He, and he kept the place out of debt. And that was hard to do back then, back then in the 40s and 50s after the war. President McIntosh marshaled his assets. An excellent faculty, including Ohio Northern legends Wilford Binkley, Rudolph Raby, and Claude W. Pettit. A facility that could be repaired. A hundred acres for future expansion. And a history of good leadership. He brought these strengths to bear on Ohio Northern's most important needs, better student housing, and formal accreditation of the university. Achieving full accreditation became the overarching initiative of his presidency. McIntosh realized the institution was going to have to come to grips with this accreditation issue. Now, that and the physical condition of campus really were operating in tandem because they needed facilities, they needed improved facilities for accreditation. If they were accredited, they could in increase enrollment. So it's not a, a really an either or situation. The two are, 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 are part of the same whole. President McIntosh put two proposals in front of his faculty, directing a course of action that focused on both immediate needs and his longer term goal. The one thing, fortunately, that Northern didn't have to worry about was buying any land because, of course, they still retained the rights to the university farm. There's about 90 acres out there. So even if they weren't going to immediately be putting buildings there, they had the, um, they had the space to. The McIntosh team made rapid progress. Within seven years, they completed a successful capital campaign, repaired the campus, and made extensive improvements. Presser Hall was refurbished and modified to house the university library. The first wing of Clark Hall, the first dormitory for women, was completed. Lima Hall, a dormitory for men, and the new student union, named in honor of Dr. Mack, were erected on what soon would become West Campus. Helper, Mike. <laughs> Look out the front, please. Oh, yeah. And this Founders Hall, we built this in, in, in opened in 64, and Gretchen and I moved into it, and in fact, it wasn't done. We were head residents here, and I was the dean of men. See, back then, of course, we had two TVs, one in the TV room and one in Bill and uh, Gretchen's uh, apartment. Well, on Thursday nights, it used to be the, the fugitive. Well, I'd have 40 guys in my living room watching The Fugitive. Those were, those were part of living on campus back there and living in a residence hall. And it was a great time, great place to be. Accreditation oh at North goodness, Central? Yes. Oh my goodness, yes. You remember the One year? One of my greatest disappointments was when we came up the first time for accreditation and turned down. I uh, literally cried like a baby. <laughs> Despite diligent preparation, Ohio Northern's application for full accreditation in 1955 was denied by the North Central Association of Colleges. Their evaluation praised ONU in many areas, but essentially concluded that the university was trying to do too much with too little. The North Central decision ignited internal controversy among faculty and administration. Some advocated staying the course and pursuing full accreditation, Others preferred to abandon the professional colleges and return to the status of a liberal arts college. That question had reared its head back as far as the report of a survey that was done in the 1930s. I have a hunch that uh, in the end, the arguments were probably pretty much what they have been ever since then, at least since I've been at Northern. And that is it's encapsulated in the uh, school's motto, from diversity, strength. There just is a certain logic to having both a professional level to the school and the liberal arts or undergraduate emphasis. McIntosh held firm with his goal of full accreditation. 
The plan succeeded, and they rejoiced when the North Central Association granted overall accreditation to ONU in 1958. With unbridled joy, McIntosh wrote, we celebrated our victory with abandon. There's this marvelous picture uh, of McIntosh at his house when his faculty were invited out, and he is literally jumping for joy. He's up on one foot waving and so forth. Classes were canceled that day. It was a, it was a, a cause for celebration. Every bit, every bit as important, indeed, and in, perhaps more so than adding a new building on campus. Well, it was a dorm, and we just tore down. Clark, Clark Hall was the only dorm, and it was for women, and there was maybe 75 women there, and that was it. We built a new girls' dorm, which is now Stamball Hall, and that, that was it, that was it. There was no place for men on campus. The fraternities, eight of them, provided room and board for men on campus. Without them, we would have had a major problem. They were part of the legacy of Ohio Law University. And the fraternities were the social life, the sororities too. They, they became national in 1959. They were local before that. I remember Count Basie Orchestra came to campus one time and they were got here early and they were looking for a place to see. The A.E. Pie House had the best kitchen and the best cook. Well, Count Basie and them found out there and they went and they had a dinner at the Ape House and they played touch football with the band on, on University Avenue. There were so many things in the life of the students that were sorority and fraternity and it were, we, we wouldn't have had a social life without them. We wouldn't have housing for men without them. To combat the housing issue, development of West Campus began to evolve during the McIntosh administration. In collaboration with former ONU alumnus and engineer Ralph Booker, the McIntosh team created a master plan for West Campus expansion. Step by step, the university followed the plan well into the 1980s, with very few changes. As more important than buildings and grounds, as more important than anything else in all the world, the son, the daughter, the education of the citizen of tomorrow, the kind of people of which we can be proud. This is a part of our destiny, and we intend to be faithful to it. I, I have two different visions of President Mack. There's President McIntosh when he first showed up on campus with the same type of professional and religious background as his predecessors. And then you have late term Mac, who even just when you look at images of him, looks like a completely different person. Changing a society is changing with him. When I see that late term Macintosh, and as I read about him, it's that later period where I think he focused a lot on the student connection and really working with students on campus to make ONU a better place for everyone. This little university is what it is today, not because of Macintosh, but because of people like you. As enrollment doubled during the 1950s and 60s, Ohio Northern built more residence halls, fraternity and sorority houses, and student service facilities to keep pace with the growth. Times were good. But the JFK assassination, the civil rights movement, and the Vietnam War were now settling hard in the American consciousness. By the time Samuel Meyer became president of Ohio Northern in 1965, the tone of the nation and its universities had changed. Part of the reason I joined a fraternity was I wanted to play basketball for the fraternity, a uh, fraternity called Phi Kappa Theta. And, uh, you know, it was a bunch of tough guys who played football and wrestled, and I think they just needed their uh, grade point average up, so they, they let me in. Long before Pixar, I worked on a, an impression of a guy named Bill Robinson at Ohio Northern, and I think it was my freshman year. He has such a distinctive voice, and I started mimicking him, and everyone's like, don't let him hear you do that. You know, it's like, well, I think he'd be fine with it. And we got to a uh, talent show, and people said, you got to do Bill Robinson's voice in the talent show. But Bill Robinson will be there. Doesn't matter. Do it. 
Hey, and so, hey, hey, Bill, Bill, Bill Robinson, Bob, hey, Bob, your brother went to Worcester, hey. And I looked over and he's like, okay, you're out of school. Go on down here, Ann. Right oh, down here. Like, drag down on that curve? Hell yes. Cut it, cut it, cut it. Cut it, some more. That's good. Ah, uh, this is it. Dial Robertson, stretcher, who brought me here, you know, and was, was a good part of turning the, the athletic department around and, and this beautiful facility that the university has now. Jimmy Tressel spoke here at the dedication of the stadium, and that was a great day for the university. Jimmy Tressel was a super person. He's the president of Youngstown State University now, but this is home to Jim, and Jim thought an awful lot. In fact, uh, Jim's, uh, one of his goals in life was to be the head football coach at Ohio Northern. Is that my mom? Yeah, that looks like Stretch. That's definitely Stretch. Stretch and Fran Robertson were kind of like uh, aunts and uncles to us. Uh, my dad and mom grew up with Stretch, so they were just like family. Every home game, Stretch sat in the suite up at the top of Ohio Stadium with my wife, Ellen. We got Stretch a big national championship ring, and then the following season, or maybe two seasons later, we made a touchdown or whatever. He started clapping, and his ring flew off and it went down to the lower deck, hundreds of feet below. Lucky it didn't kill somebody, those were heavy rings. He loved being a part of the community, the athletic department, the lives of the students at Ohio Northern, and he loved the game of football. Football and baseball were first played at Ohio Northern in the late 1800s. They were primarily club sports in the early years, organized by the students themselves and athletically-minded faculty coaches. But several events propelled the evolution of a formal athletic program. Tommy Small, a player coach and dean of engineering, organized the Ohio Northern Athletic Board in 1908. He was also a driving force in gaining ONU's admission to the Ohio Athletic Conference in 1916. Small later became known as the father of ONU athletics. In 1921, the Department of Physical Education was officially created. Clyde Lamb, who would become an ONU legend over the next 40 years, joined the physical education and coaching staff in 1929. And in 1923, Ohio Northern formally introduced what was to become the university's own brand. So the polar bear. If you go to Ohio Northern, you identify with the polar bear. It's an Ohio Northern thing. And I, I think if you know about the polar bear, you know it's aggressive. You know you don't mess with it, but it's beautiful. In 1927, when they built Taft Gym, of course, at, at that time, Taft Gym was the nicest gymnasium in Ohio. I taught my first seven years in Taft Gym, and until you've taught in Taft Gym, where you have to put your foot on the wall to be out of bounds to serve a volleyball, uh, you can't appreciate the facilities we have at Kinghorn. When I was a kid going in Taft thinking, you know, I thought at the time it was big, but realizing looking back now, you know, we really outgrew our shoes, and it was time to move out here, and I remember when this facility was built. It's all cyclical. You, you, you grow into what you have, and then you outgrow what you have. You can't talk about ONU athletics without talking about the big two, and that'd be Clyde Lamb and Helen Ludwig. It's, you, you just can't do it. My respect for a Marv English is endless. Um, Gail Doherty is someone who I was fortunate to follow, and I'm still trying to find a way to fill the massive footprint he left here. Marv English called me and said, we want to fly you in. And uh, they flew Bev and I in, and of course, we had old Taft Jim at the time and showed us all over. And the last thing Marv did was take me to Taft and he was kind of apologizing. You know, we're gonna get a new one here in a couple of years, but I said, Marv, this is a great place. I said, we'll lock the doors and just beat the heck out of people. This is wonderful.
I think some of the defining moments in Ohio Northern Athletics history is joining the NCAA. Joe Campoli, in his first year as a head coach, uh, won a national championship in NCAA Division III. That was the first and only national championship the university has had. The start and the growth and the success of women's athletics, huge why I had selected Ohio Northern even before making that decision uh, can be summed up in two words, Helen Ludwig. In 37 powerful words, Title IX protects people from discrimination based on sex in education programs or activities that receive federal financial assistance. Long before the law was passed in 1972 and for many years after, teacher and coach Helen Ludwig worked vigorously to create equal opportunities in intercollegiate sports for female athletes at Ohio Northern. Helen was a super athlete, a great athlete, and she started the program. Hired Gail Louth and, and uh, so many others. The women's program has excelled, excelled extremely well. Kate Whitty would be an awesome resource to talk to because she would always talk to us about the giants that came before us, that kind of paved the way for us, basically set in motion women athletics and kind of put the foundation there that we would have the same opportunities as our male counterparts. Well, those who are old enough to remember the history of how everything evolved with the Hall of Fame knew that it wasn't always peaches and cream. Uh, when it started out, it was men only. I was very, very glad when they changed that rule. But the Hall of Fame, I think, is a wonderful mechanism for acknowledging the value of athletics to the mission of the institution. And I'm very proud to be a member of the Hall of Fame, as uh, I believe everyone who is inducted into it feels that same pride. If you look at, at athletics from a 20,000 foot level, it's just constant change. We walk a fine line in, in, in producing a place that is accessible to the athlete and to the student. And I'm just, I know I always talk about that, but I really want to be that way in making our facilities and, and the things that we do meaningful experiences for both sides. We get great student athletes here and they are student athletes. They're not here just to be athletes. They are student athletes. Every one of those kids are getting their degrees and they go out and they do very well in life. I don't see how you could possibly go wrong coming to Ohio Northern University. I mean, they've got it all. By the way, Dr. Meyer is the epitome of this institution. We were up in uh, in McIntosh. Remember how they used to have guest rooms up there? And we got up the second day, and I happened to look out, and I saw this gentleman in a suit, well-dressed, and he walked out on the, and there was dew on the grass. This was in April. And he picked something up, and it was a wrapper or something, and he stuck it in his pocket. It was Dr. Meyer. And I've always said, that's why this campus looks the way it is. It's just been passed down generation to generation. Samuel Lewis Meyer became president of Ohio Northern in 1965, a time when America stood on the brink of sweeping change. Unlike all of his predecessors, with the exception of Henry Solomon Lur, he was not a Methodist minister. But his commitment to Christian higher education was every bit as strong. With advanced degrees in science and botany, Meyer was a dedicated academician and, much like his predecessor, Dr. Mack, successfully led the pursuit of academic excellence. We accept the challenge to continue academic excellence. Our first moves in that direction will be to provide teaching of excellence, to offer curricula of excellence, and to maintain standards of excellence in academic achievement. It was such, such a difference. Dr. McIntosh was called Black Mac, and he's very stern. He was a Methodist minister, very solid, solid person. But Sam came in, and Sam was Mr. Personality. And he was responsible for all of the honoraries and, and all the academic processes, and, and he, he made it an, an academic institution. But Sam was Sam. He came back from Korea once and he lost his hair for some reason. Anyway, he called Terry Kaiser in one way and he had a tam on. He was gonna wear this tam because he was so, you know, embarrassed about losing his hair. And he says, what do you think? And we both laughed and he threw us out of his office. <laughs> President Meyer's commitment to excellence was tested immediately 
when the College of Pharmacy lost its accreditation in 1965. His administration moved decisively to revise the pharmacy curriculum and complete the construction of a new pharmacy building, which had been started in the previous administration. The Robertson Evans Pharmacy Building was dedicated in 1966, and the College of Pharmacy regained accredited status in 1969. I am happy that I have had the opportunity to see the construction of this building. I am sure that Dr. Myers and the Board of Trustees will continue the good work that has been done in the College of Pharmacy heretofore. Back in the 1960s, we had a period of time when we struggled with accreditation uh, with our accrediting body, and it really had only to do with the physical facilities. We were at that time located in the basement of Dukes, and um, it just was not sufficient for what we were, for the numbers that we had or the needs that we had for training pharmacists back in that period of time. The administration at that time was supportive of a new building for us, which was incredibly important. Not only did it restore the accreditation for the program, but really launched us to where we're at today. The mid-1960s found Ohio Northern well positioned for greater expansion. Huge enrollment increases were expected as post-World War II baby boom children rapidly approached college age. A fundraising campaign tied to the upcoming centennial celebration supported many construction projects. It is my pleasure to announce the new College of Engineering building at Ohio Northern University has been named the Robert W. Biggs Engineering Building. New academic facilities also included the Samuel L. Meyer Hall of Science, the Earl B. Tilton Law Building, the English Chapel, the Wilson Art Center, and Hederick Memorial Library. The library at that time was in Presser Hall. And the question was, well, how are you going to get the books from Presser Hall over to the new library? They had a book brigade and all of us, uh, underclassmen, I don't know how, how high up, but we, we had boxes. Each one of us had a box. They'd load those boxes with books and we had a constant back and forth to the uh, New library. We have pictures of the students carrying the books out, going across the uh, 1968 West Campus. Now, the campus, as I think we have touched on, is known to the students even today, colloquially, as the tundra. In 1968, there was nothing there. It really was a tundra, and this was in the winter, and it was snowy, and everybody was bundled up the people seemed to be moving extremely fast. The very next day when the library opened, uh, on I believe it was Valentine's Day, the collection was in its proper place and ready to go. The Meyer era expansion also included the construction of the Kinghorn Athletic Center, which was a welcome replacement to aging Taft Gym, especially when it came to live entertainment. There was a hole in the ceiling of Taft Gym and the bats used to come down. Johnny Mathis was singing and a bat came and he ducked and moved away. Did not know it was a bat. <sighs> Additional student housing was also constructed. The park and McGlot wings were added to Founders Hall and new houses were built for the Alpha Sigma Phi and Phi Kappa Theta fraternities. On June 11, 1977, a formal ceremony was held officially uniting the East and West Campus. The demand for social change that grew louder in the mid-1960s was actively embraced by the Ohio Northern community. The Meyer administration established official policies for non-discrimination and affirmative action, and both students and faculty engaged with the social and political issues of the time. One active participant was Ohio Northern Chaplain James Judy. Jim was a very, he was an Australian guy, ultra liberal. He was Martin Luther King's classmate. He is the one who brought Martin Luther King here to speak. He picked him up at the airport in Finley and drove him down and uh, uh, brought to the back door of, 
of Taft Gym, which people didn't even know it was. And there were steps that come right up and he'd come right in and right up on the stage and actually left the same way right afterwards. So he really was not on campus any length of time, primarily because of the fear of, of problems. In uh, January of 1968, uh, King was the most hated black man in white America because he'd come out against the Vietnam War in March of 1967, and he was exhausted. You can see the pictures. He's just a, he, he was uh, running on fumes. The gym was covered with chairs. Dr. King stood at the west end of the gym under a basket on a prepared uh, podium. They had people underneath the chairs. The fire marshal these days would have said, no, uh, uh. But back then, uh, you know, the place was packed and then they they put about uh, two thirds of the Lure Auditorium over here filled for, a, for an audio feed. No, oh, no, did I move it? Here we go. So another point of pride in our holdings is our materials related to Dr. King's visit to ONU campus. It's uh, one of the original pressings of the audio recording of his speech here. On behalf of Ohio Northern University, I would like to welcome Dr. King to this campus, the 12th American and the youngest recipient of the Nobel Prize. Dr. King. Dr. Udy, members of the faculty, members of the student body of this great institution of learning, ladies and gentlemen, we have come a long, long way, but we have a long, long way to go before the problem of racial injustice is solved in our nation. The whole nation has made strides in extending the frontiers of civil rights. And I haven't lost faith in the future. We will be able to transform the jangling discords of our nation into a beautiful symphony of brotherhood. And he spoke. And, and, and I will never forget that speech. It was such a great pleasure that I had the opportunity to, to hear him. He was just a good man. It was quite a, quite a blessing. His very last words were, Free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty, we are free at last. Thank you. On April 4th, 1968, just months after speaking at Ohio Northern, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated in Memphis, Tennessee. One of the things that's really difficult for me about it is that there are, there are students that don't really know who Dr. Martin Luther King was. Um, and I'm always shocked, I think, when I hear that. I feel like now that we have a statue of Dr. King on campus, that has raised the profile and caused students to think about it a little bit more deeply. This is part of our heritage. It's one of the high points in the history of Ohio Northern. It's, it's one of our, uh, we, can, we can glory in it because we were willing to bring him here at a time when he was really, really hated in those days. He, he didn't expect to live, but nonetheless he came here at the invitation of his friend. Many places have plaques, and a plaque lays down, but a statue stands up. And that's the significance of erecting that statue, that we were standing up and making a comment for all the world to hear and see. President Meyer continued to lead Ohio Northern until his retirement in 1977. Throughout the tumultuous 60s and 70s, the campus community had remained discerning and calm largely avoiding the discord that troubled many large universities. Life at Ohio Northern would soon change. Dr. Raymond Leshner accepted the presidency of Ohio Northern in 1977. Although he served for only two years, he introduced ideas that would resound for many more. 
Leshner recognized that the pool of baby boom college students would dry up in the early 1980s and led initiatives to prepare Northern for the future. He restructured the College of Liberal Arts, advocating curriculum changes that would offer meaningful majors and produce graduates with readily marketable skills. He also expanded the student internship program to include all undergraduates in all the colleges and supported changing from the quarter system to semesters. But undoubtedly, President Leshner's most significant accomplishment was establishing a new College of Business Administration, separate from the College of Liberal Arts. I think for me, obviously, as Dean of the College of Business, the defining moment has to be when the College of Business itself was formed as it separated itself out from the College of Arts and Sciences. It really allowed us an opportunity to specialize, but still have that in-depth connection to the liberal arts education. President Leshner resigned for personal reasons in 1979. Although his initiatives had not always been well received by Northern's faculty, the future proved that most of his ideas were sound and very likely ahead of their time. He had lots of ideas. I think looking back, we can say were good ideas, but he wasn't the right communicator for the campus at the time. And that created a lot of conflict and a lot of tension that worked against his ideals of helping move the university forward. Lester came in with ideas that were really good for the university uh, with respect to uh, curriculum, with respect to its uh, institutional structure and, and so forth. And, but he, he didn't have the patience that it took to get it done, but Freed did. And then Freed took Leshner's agenda and he implemented it, item by item, over the course of about 15 years, 20 years. On Christmas Eve, 1979, a moving truck containing the belongings of Ohio Northern's ninth president arrived at the president's home on West Lima Avenue. It was the quiet beginning of the DeBeau Freed presidency that would thrive for the next 20 years. Dr. Freed would lead Ohio Northern through phenomenal growth, encompassing new academic programs, extensive campus expansion, and the adoption of new technologies. But first, there were difficult issues to resolve. In the late 1970s, Ohio Northern was in turmoil. The faculty had unionized over issues such as compensation, insurance, and leave. Dissension flared between students and administration over university policies on visitation and alcohol. Student morale was at a low ebb. The university needed communication, reassurance, and firm leadership with a steady hand. Dr. Freed brought all of these qualities to Ohio Northern, along with a calming force that promised a return to normalcy. He was very sensitive, very sensitive. Uh, he cared very, very much. Christian caring concern was his term, and he lived it. He had a kind of simple elegance to him. He stood up straight. He, he polished his shoes. You could see the military man in him. Kind of soft-spoken, but very much a gentleman. And uh, it was just nice to have that calming influence as our president. Dr. Freed was both the steady hand but also the visionary that the university needed after President Lochner's term. A steady hand in that he helped tensions calm down on campus and bring back a sense of unity and people working together. But then he wasn't content for the university to rest on its laurels. Whether attributable to fewer available students as the baby boom ran its course, Ohio Northern suffered a decline in overall enrollment in the 1980s. Rather than following a typical strategy of retrenchment, Freed selectively strengthened the curriculum. Throughout the 80s and 90s, new majors, including biochemistry, criminal justice, broadcasting, and sports management, reflected student interest and a changing job market. In the College of Pharmacy, ONU's PharmD doctoral degree was approved by the Ohio Board of Regents in 1993. Ohio Northern's enrollment climbed steadily throughout the decade, ultimately nearing 3,200 in the fall of 1999. Two highly successful capital campaigns were completed during the freed years. Strength for the 1980s provided funds for robust campus expansion, including the Freed Center for the Performing Arts, 
and expansion of the Kinghorn Sports Center. Completed in 1991, the Freed Center was designed specifically as a performing arts complex. It was the first building dedicated to the performing arts since the demise of the Ada Opera House in 1910. The original vision was to fulfill the requirements expected of a theater and music program. Both had been functioning well. They'd been in uh, constrained facilities. The theater department had been working under rather severe conditions for a long time. It is an element of uh, visible culture that uh, has been beneficial. It has brought the type music and the type events that just were not available elsewhere and before this. I watched as a student Kinghorn become the field house and then the Freed Center be built um, outside of my dorm room. I mean, I literally watched the steel going in the ground and the cornfield turning into a building. Um, he had a number of great initiatives on the campus, but just the infrastructure of what he built was one of those legacies that is lasting. The field house itself, um, with the 300 meter track, was the largest of its type in the Midwest and uh, sort of created uh, winter indoor track meets. And uh, an, an invitation to come here for a Friday night track meet was very much sought after. The front campus and west campus merged in 1986, fully connecting the entire campus. The campaign for the 21st century, launched in the mid-1990s, secured ONU's financial stability and grew the university endowment to $100 million. More than 1,200 computers are networked throughout the campus and are available in all academic buildings and residence halls. Technology reached Ohio Northern in a powerful way during the Freed Presidency. As computer usage spread throughout the campus, the installation of a fiber optic network and internet accessibility connected Ohio Northern to the world. Most of the residence halls had internet access by 1995. By the end of the 90s, the campus, uh, just about all of the buildings, had some connection to a uh, campus network. This was about the time that the internet, as we, as we know it today, started to come into existence. Many people might not find it so marvelous today, uh, but suddenly Northern was connected to the rest of the, uh, the country, the rest of the world, at the push of a button. The Greek organizations were a mainstay on campus throughout the 80s and 90s. The appetite for fun shared by all ONU students was much the same as their predecessors in earlier generations. Dr. Freed, in the 80s, I had the pleasure of picking him up from the airport and taking him to an event. And uh, along the way, we had a nice chat and, and I said, now you know someone tried to water ski across the pond in fraternity circle there using a Volkswagen bug to tow. And he just nodded and said, yes, college is a good time to have fun. <laughs> Fraternities and sororities, they went out and had to get something from the, the cemetery in Ada or from the high school or from the engineering building. And one of the things is the biggest thing they could get and the fraternity went and the kid went and knocked on Dr. Freed's door and says, can I have your car? His old Oldsmobile, was it? And anyway, Dr. Freed gave him the key and the kid took the, took the and they won the contest. And of course, Tunes in the Tundra was another big thing at Ohio Northern University. It was an all day party. There was a stage right out here and the students uh, had concerts all day long and they had their, their beer hang, hanging out the windows of the dorms. Had a lot of big bands going continuous all day. And uh, it was a party, tunes in the tundra. Approximately 25 years after Martin Luther King's speech at Ohio Northern, members of his family visited campus on several occasions. The late 90s were, in Dr. Freed's own words, a period of increasing diversity and multicultural awareness. Oh, the vibe on campus was um, energized. I think there was a lot. I felt like coming from a smaller high school that it felt lots bigger to me. 
that felt diverse. I was meeting a lot of different people from many more places than I had ever been accustomed to, and I felt energized. In the 1990s, you had a reemergence of people recognizing the importance and the value of diversity on ONU's campus. And so you had President Freed at the time publicly speaking about the importance of diversity, but moving beyond just speaking and hiring people into high level positions that represented that diversity and supporting them to succeed with their jobs. Dr. Freed hit a time when diversity was non-existent. So what he did, I remember clearly, his goal was to diversify our staff. During my time here, we had more people of color here under Dr. Free than all the other schools combined. It also allowed our white students to see diversity at a small school, which was awesome. It was awesome. Much like ONU founder Henry Solomon Lur, Debo Freed remained, first and foremost, a president devoted to his students, while guiding Ohio Northern toward the new millennium. Of course, we all remember final exam treats. That's probably like the thing that Dr. Freed and Mrs. Freed were recognized even nationally in the magazines for everything this president does for his students. It was legitimate. He just was that president that knew everyone's name. I think that was the biggest thing. I'm not sure whether he knew everybody, but he certainly knew me by name. And um, that really makes you feel special, uh, even today, you know, to come in and after so many years, he was so excited and he always did, did his research. So he had uh, researched my career and my background. I think it was just a natural uh, curiosity and care for people that he came in contact with. From flower baskets decorating Ada's Main Street, to the ambiance of the Freed Center for the Performing Arts. Dr. Freed and his wife, Kitty, brought an elegance to Ohio Northern. They added a graceful touch to the campus and the community. This is that love, that compassion. I mean, students felt like they could just tell him anything. Students were always, you know, whenever he appeared on campus, they were running up to him, talking to him, telling him, you know, what's going on with their day. He just had that quiet, gentle way of everybody just feeling like he really cares and, you know, we can tell him whatever. And of course, I felt that too. <laughs> so yeah, I think of Christian care and concern. Debo Freed retired in 1999. He maintained a close friendship with the Ohio Northern community and the village of Ada until his death in 2020. When I learned about ONU, so I was like on my college search and I was looking for football and engineering and all these things. And I kind of came across ONU through a friend who, he was like, yeah, man, you gotta come see it. But like in my mind, I feel like I already kind of knew it was the place for me before I even came here. Because you run into all these different programs that are like, okay, well, like we can do engineering or football, but then most of the engineering majors either stop playing football because they can't handle it or they're not doing well in engineering because the coaches don't prioritize the scholastic part of it like they do here. Like if I needed to miss a football practice for a class, okay, like Coach Paul would, yeah, go to class. So that's kind of like, I don't know, that's just something I didn't really see anywhere else, if that makes any sense. The appointment of President Kendall Baker in 1999 signaled a fresh approach to leadership at Ohio Northern. The time was right. Rapid advancements in technology and the sciences were creating new methods of learning and new career opportunities for graduates with the right skills. The university and its new president were poised to meet the educational challenges of the new century. I think they were looking for a personality after DeBow. Ken Baker was Mr. Personality, Mr. Personality, and I think that was effective in his, his start and his, his involvement as president. Well, they were looking for somebody who would bring the university forward into the 21st century. He was the kind of person that would do mud volleyball. Uh, he, would be the, he was the kind of person that would carry the boxes in. He was into physical fitness. And he ate in the uh, dining hall 
with his wife, but he ate there so that they were accessible to students. He went to student things. Dr. Baker was energy. Very first thing that comes to mind is energy. <laughs> That man was just always able to pull up yet another level of excitement. Um, when you would expect, you know, an administration person to be like, yeah, here I am again at another student, whatever. And that man would be just cheering, he'd be clapping, he'd be engaged. When I decided what I was gonna do with my life and the career that I was going to choose and, and all those sort of things, I committed myself to being able to make a contribution. I was going to emphasize the importance of being engaged and the importance of service and the importance of contribution. We live this university uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and we love it, and we love it. Baker and his wife, Toby, represented a generational shift in university administration. Student-oriented, exuberant, and highly visible on campus, their leadership style fit perfectly with the changing times. The Baker's engagement with the ONU community reflected a love of people that rang true with ONU students who responded in kind. They loved him and he was, you know, smiled. You know, he was, his personality was on his fingertips 24-7. Toby Baker loved the students. The new house was built, they went in it, and they entertained every week. They had students in there. Sororities would go out there all the time and they'd bring them in if they were sitting in their pajamas watching TV. That was Toby and Ken, without question. Huge enrollment growth throughout the late 1990s had left Ohio Northern with a shortage of student housing. Much of the campus expansion during the Baker presidency focused on satisfying that need. The housing transformation that happened when we started building varied types of living situations and went from all pretty much traditional residence halls to having suite style living and then apartments. I think that was pretty big. That was a big change, I think, for the university community. It's called Baker Commons. People don't know it. There's a sign out there, but it's Baker Commons, all the residence halls out there. He was responsible for, for building them without question. Other major projects included Dial Robertson Stadium, the Inn at Ohio Northern University, and a new state-of-the-art facility for the College of Business, which was renamed the James F. Dickey College of Business Administration. President Baker recognized that continual advances in science and technology were creating new career possibilities and a rapidly evolving job market. To help students prepare for these opportunities, the university developed new majors in forensic biology, pharmaceutical business, and nursing. Northern's campus grew as well, with construction of the Matil Center for the Natural Sciences and the Hakes Pierstore Family Pharmacy Education Center. In the mid-2000s, we added on the Hakes Pierstore Family Education Center, and so bo both the Pierstore families and the Hakes families were tremendously insightful visionaries to help see what it would take to advance the College of Pharmacy. Somebody did it before me. I want to do it as much as I can as long as I live with the hopes that somebody else will take over. What we do is just recycle what God gave to us. The Baker era also introduced specialized international programs, which helped educate other countries on the principles of democracy. The Claude W. Pettit School of Law offered the LLM, or Master of Laws program, in democratic governance and rule of law. We ran that for about 15 years, and that was an LLM in democracy. And again, that program allowed the campus to meet students from around the world in often developing countries that were struggling to launch a democracy government. Ken Baker completed his work at Ohio Northern in 2011. He may be remembered as the president who shared many personal qualities with university founder Henry Solomon Lur. Both men had cheerful demeanors and seemingly boundless energy. Both were student-oriented and truly loved being educators. It is fitting that Northern erected a memorial to Henry Lur during Baker's tenure. Ken, when he had money, I went to him and said, we need a statue of Henry Solomon Lur right at the intersection of the, of the main axis of the campus east and west and the sidewalk that goes north and south. He said, okay. 
It was John Lomax's idea that we should do a way of honoring Lur. We hired an architect out of Ann Arbor, Michigan, and uh, he built this statue of Henry Solomon Lur, and it's the front page of the university and just significant, significant importance to the university because he was the founder. It has been the pride of this institution over 136 years to be able to continue that very, very special mission that H.S. Lur created back in 1871. That's part of our reputation, part of our history, part of our legacy. You know, Henry Solomon. Yeah. It's an unbelievable story to be able to tell people as they walk through the building, right? That the, the person whose name is on the building, the person that created this beautiful piece of art that's in the, in the center of the building, not only loves Ohio Northern and has been generous, but is the great grandson of the founder of the institution. I mean, it's, it's storybook, right? You can't, you couldn't make that up. What would you say are the most significant initiatives that you've had? Probably the most significant initiative um, was um, the construction and building of the new engineering building. Um, the opportunity that we have to, to really prepare 21st century engineers in a facility that allows us to do that. When Daniel DiBiasio became the 11th president of Ohio Northern in 2011, colleges and universities throughout the nation were reeling from the impact of the Great Recession. Ohio Northern was not exempt. As enrollment dropped, the university needed a new kind of leadership. With strong management skills, fiscal responsibility, and a keen sense of utilizing Ohio Northern's inherent strengths, DiBiasio was the right president at the right time. With integrity being paramount, President DiBiasio and university leadership established strategic priorities that would consolidate and expand programs and ultimately restructure ONU for the future. In the following years, the university would bring technology to the forefront of teaching and learning, rebuild enrollment, confront the COVID-19 pandemic, and vigorously pursue equality for all. President DiBiasio guided ONU through a successful transformation, always leading with strength, fortitude, sensitivity, and a reassuring sense of calm. Dr. DiBiasio, hell, he's a West Side Cleveland guy. And his wife, Chris, I mean, she's from Vermont. He played ball. His father was a coach at Lakewood High School in Cleveland. You know, he's, he's, another, he's another Clevelander. He, I'm East Side, he's West Side, you know, uh, and, and, and just a heck of a nice guy. I remember when I first met him, I came away from my first meeting thinking, I really like him. <laughs> I think he comes across with such a genuine, caring, inviting kind of energy that I think people feel like they can connect with him. I felt like this is like a really good person that really cares and he's learning a lot about the university, um, coming in at some turbulent times actually. What really impressed me about Ohio Northern was its size and scope. It's a small institution by comparison to many, but the scope of programs makes it a true university. That excited me about this institution. In addition to the new engineering building, initiatives included greater focus on digital technologies and collaborative learning, adjusting academic programs, improving recruitment methods and application processing, and aggressive action plans for diversity, equity, and inclusion. I think one of the things we realized at the uh, 50th anniversary of Martin Luther King Jr.'s visit to our campus was that we needed to take a more comprehensive view of how we could uh, improve our efforts at diversity, equity, and inclusion. We established a commission to, to do just that and establish a number of goals, one of which was to increase the number of scholarships for students of color. And that is paying off. We will have the highest number of students of color in this year's freshman class than we ever had. So we're, we're making some strides. We have a long way to go. Some members of the football team and one of the student organizations called Brother to Brother came together to have an event that they called ON Unity. 
And this Owen Unity event was meant to bring the community together to say that we stand together. And I think the statue symbolized unity for them. So they envisioned something that would take them um, with a group of people walking from the fraternity circle down to the Martin Luther King statue and kind of a closing ceremony there. And that's actually what they did. They incorporated a discussion piece into it so that they got groups in small circles and to have conversation about what does it mean to be unified on campus and you know what's the importance of that and have people pledge to be unified on campus and to participate in activities that would promote unity. So the goal of this is to promote unity, is to bring us all one step closer by establishing an understanding. Keep these ideas in mind. Thank you. The COVID-19 pandemic shocked the world in early 2020. Life changed from normal everyday routine to lockdown, work from home, protective face masks, and social distancing. Ohio Northern met the challenge head on. The DBSU administration led a campus-wide effort to fulfill ONU's mission and keep students, faculty, and staff safe during the pandemic. I think we learned we're more resilient than we may have thought. We had to uh, embrace change, we had to be flexible, and we had to accelerate uh, some of those changes that we needed to implement. So we, we surprised ourselves in that regard through the uh, perseverance, dedication, commitment of our faculty and our staff and our students. We were able to deliver in-person education all year without interruption. Our faculty were able to pivot from in-person education to a virtual environment in four days notice. That will influence us as we proceed in the next coming short five-year time frame, as we'll likely develop more online instruction opportunity and perhaps additional online programs. We saw that faculty uh, embraced technology even more so during the pandemic. We had students who were isolated or quarantined and needed to learn remotely um, and faculty um, were able to deliver, I think is going to be beneficial to us in the future. The integration of digital technologies for teaching and learning will continue to evolve at Ohio Northern. The university is also focused on developing functional spaces on campus needed for successful collaboration. Collaborating and using tools together uh, is so important. So we've got to make sure we've got the places and the spaces and the technology available to students uh, and faculty. It allows us to make the classroom the world and gives us so many advantages to deepen and enrich the learning experience for students. I think it'll definitely be a new normal. I think some of the things that we've done in the past, we look back and we're like, why did we ever do that? Because <laughs> we've had to change because of the pandemic. These have by far been the best years of my life. Ohio Northern has provided me with so much, so much. From the time they joined the Ohio Northern family, President DiBiasio and First Lady Chris Burns DiBiasio have continually emphasized the importance of service and civic engagement. Perhaps more than any other initiative, their dedication in this area echoes the foundational ideas of Henry Solomon Lur. In her volunteer role as Director of Community Relations, Chris's leadership has established several new traditions at Ohio Northern. ADA Community Engagement Day, or ACE Day, provides an opportunity for incoming freshmen to serve the ADA community. As a board member of the Lima Symphony Orchestra, Chris led a collaborative effort to create the Patriotic Pops Concert. The annual event brings the orchestra to the ONU campus every summer for a free 4th of July performance. Additionally, Mrs. DiBiasio co-advises the ONU chapter of the Mortarboard National College Senior Honor Society. She has also directed an initiative to use local produce on campus, making a substantial improvement to the diet of the ONU community. 
President DiBiasio has provided leadership support for the development of the College of Pharmacy's HealthWise Mobile Health Clinic and the new Institute of Civics and Public Policy in the College of Arts and Sciences. Dr. DiBiasio is so experienced at being a president that I don't think there's a situation he hasn't seen or hasn't encountered. He came to Northern and let it show him who we were, and then he's worked with us to push us forward. President DiBiasio is a leader who both isn't afraid to lead, but also isn't afraid to lean on and listen to the experts that are around him here at ONU. That type of leadership style has really benefited the university. As President DiBiasio prepares to welcome a successor, Ohio Northern's endowment is approaching $200 million. Enrollment is now thriving. The new student class for fall 2021 is the largest since the Great Recession of 2008. Thanks to President DiBiasio's leadership, Ohio Northern is clearly well positioned for future success. My hopes and dreams for the university are to see more students have the opportunity to prepare themselves for their life's journey and going out with a great education, with time here in a very safe, supportive, wonderful community and using those gifts to make a transformational impact. I'm just humbled by the opportunity that God gives us when we're in these roles to be part of young people's lives. What we're all working for is making that person better and in turn making the world better. In the coming years, Ohio Northern will likely face unfavorable demographic trends and an uphill battle to sustain and increase enrollment. The university has been there before, many times. Northern will greet the challenge with the same courage and perseverance that has helped it overcome periods of crisis for 150 years. 150 years of education is going to be valued. We are not the new person on the block that is going to falter. Um, we are have been through a lot. World War I, World War II, you can hear in the stories about how Northern had shrunk and had almost closed, but we still persevered and we're still here today. I think for us to thrive, we've got to continue to be cognizant of what our society needs and be willing to adjust new fields new programs, staying true to our mission will, will help us continue to have another 150 years or more. As long as this university stays true to itself, and as far as I can tell, it has, it is one academic powerhouse. It's the little engine that could. I always like that sign that they put over there. That It used to be the sign over the university powerhouse, actually, and it says, Oh, and you powerhouse on it. And I think, yeah, that's right. It is a powerhouse. It's an academic and scholarly powerhouse. Henry Solomon Lur, his vision for the university, his ideas about the mission of the university ran like a thread through the whole history of the university. And that's what endures. I think the school from its inception, from its very inception, existed in the mind of the, of the founder with this idea of service to other people, of empowering other people, whether it's teaching people to read in log cabins in Northwest Ohio or training lawyers to make arguments before the, the Supreme Court, it doesn't matter. It's the way in which we approach the work that does matter. That spirit is still with us. I think one of the first things that I fell in love with about Ohio Northern was how personalized the experience could be for every student. I think every student realizes that if they have a need, a want, a desire, that there's a way that we can work with them to make that come to fruition. Oh, uh, you know, I love the place. It's a great life. It was an easy life. I, 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 I didn't think I worked. I just loved it. You know, deal with students, deal with young people. You couldn't ask for a better life. 
couldn't ask for a better life. How can you not love the place? How can you not feel it part of your life? How can you not? You know, it's home. Home. As I now remember, those days were the happiest in my life. I now felt sure that one of the cherished objects of my life would prove successful. Henry Solomon Lur. I had the benefit of reading his journals. And you read those and it's like the man is right there and you get to know him. And you get to know his soul. That's how I can say, having read his journals, you'd say, Northern has been true to my ideals. I'm not surprised, but I'm glad. Thank you.